In fact, the next speaker is going to be really uh, following right in, uh, you're right in the footsteps of Chris's uh, presentation. Uh, Ricardo Ruiz will talk about how a central bank with a negative net worth can pursue monetary policy. Good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so I've been doing some research recently on uh, uh, if you want a measurement of financial strength for central banks. And so Mark has asked me to basically, this was almost literally the question he asked me, what happens if the ECB loses a lot of money or the Fed loses a lot of money, given its status and balance sheet risk? And so I'm going to talk about that. And initially, I thought maybe I'll be do, talking a lot about my recent research. But in the end, I think I'll barely have time for that, or probably not at all. But instead, I'll just go over some things that I'm afraid to some people in the audience may seem almost obvious, but if, even if so, seem to be restated in terms of uh, exactly how does central bank, how do central banks are very different from private corporations and in which ways they are. But let me start with um, some facts to set up the questions that I'll answer. The first one is central banks lose money all the time. So here's a bunch of uh, Latin American countries, and this is their profits, their losses actually, since there's a lot of negatives there. And it happens very frequently that central banks suffer losses. This is not at all a rare thing at all. Okay? This was Latin America, but the same has happened in Asia throughout the late 90s and early 2000s. Very often, you do lose money as a central bank. It's not the case that, even though the Fed, I think, has not posted a loss in a very long time, it is quite frequent for central banks to lose money. Uh, sometimes the losses are really big. So in the case of Chile, in 1997, they lost basically five times their net worth. So they didn't just go into negative net worth, they went into very negative net worth. Um, and likewise, the Czech Republic has been running with negative net worth for about the last five or six years, I believe. Um, and they run, and it's fine, and the world didn't end in the Czech Republic just because they had negative net worth. But it does happen. Um, usually, though, this doesn't happen in the big four central banks, the Bank of England, the Euro system, the Fed, and the Bank of Japan. And why not? Because those countries, or let me, let me specialize in the Fed, usually has a balance sheet that has only the parts that I put here with the red brackets. That is, you have some monetary basis, a liability, and you have as an asset, essentially, in the case of the Fed, just some government securities, some bonds. And so far as the bonds are fairly short term, as in the monetary base, and given that almost always, or even all always, they will be earning a return higher than the monetary base, it therefore follows that you're always going to be earning some, somewhat of a positive return, or almost essentially always. Okay? Your liabilities pays your interest. Your bonds, may, your three-month T-bills that you're holding like the Fed has been holding may pay close to zero, but they always pay positive. And so you're not going to be losing any money. The same applies for the loans that DCB charges. The, loan, the DCB does not hold government securities, but instead makes loans. Uh, and if it sometimes, most of its loans are in terms of refinancing operations, and again, they work in the same way, learning a very low interest rate, and sometimes both DCB or the Fed can make loans to the discount window at a very high interest rate, in which case they make even more money. But it's very, very hard for them to lose money in this. What, it, what then distinguishes these banks from, for the most part, from those developing country banks that lose money all the time? Um, it's not the soundness of the institutions or other things, it's simply that the other ones hold very large foreign reserves. And so when you're holding a lot of foreign reserves and a lot of those losses, come with the fact that when the exchange rate changes, you're going to lose money. And that does not have, unlike the monetary base, that has no floor and you can need to lose quite a bit of money. So most of those losses are out were because of foreign exchange reserves. Now, the big four central banks, though, are now in a different world from what they've been. And here is just the plot that many have seen, which is simply the explosion in the assets of the Federal Reserve System. Um, and which is here are compared to the euro system of the Bank of Japan, but just to say that relative to GDP, we basically almost, we doubled or more, the Federal Reserve was the one that increased the more, doubled or more the size of its balance sheet. So it increased a lot in the number of assets. Okay? This is, this increase was very large even in an historical perspective. Um, for most countries, it's hard to go very far back in time. I mean, after all, the Fed is barely of this barely 100 years old. For England, you could go back as much as almost 200 years in terms of the size of their balance sheet. And you see that the balance is basically at the level as it hadn't been at, during World War II. So it's reached a very, very high level um, uh, for what is customary or certainly what is historical. Okay? The size in itself, again, doesn't invalidate the argument that I made earlier, that as long as it was monetary based on the one side and short-term bonds on the other one, and as long as short-term bonds essentially almost always will yield a higher return than the monetary base, and still this would not imply any losses. What changed though is of course the composition. And here you have the composition of those assets that the Fed is holding, in blue the total, and the very interesting one is of course the green one, the many liquidity facilities. And so for a while the asset 
the assets of the Fed look very, very interesting. But while I could be talking about that part, I'm going to be talking about the present where they stop being interesting. So far as almost all of those are almost all of them are gone. And now the assets are again back into bonds, but with a very important difference, which is that the bonds are no longer short-term bonds, but now are long-term bonds. They're no longer treasury bills, but they're treasury notes. Okay? So here you have it. This is the last balance sheet, the one that got published last Friday. A new one will come up this week. But you see that in the assets, essentially, no even Fed has pretty much run out of bills by now. It also doesn't hold almost any T bill. It's all basically treasury notes and bonds and mortgage-backed securities. Okay? And on the other side is basically notes and reserves. ECB is a little bit different, even if similar, in that in the beginning, at the start, which is the chart on the left-hand side, you also had a little bit of these other liquidity operations, but immediately the big increase was on that blue thing, which was long-term refinancing, which essentially was almost equivalent to buying long-term bonds. That is, was offering long-term loans backed by long-term bonds. Okay? Then the first plot only goes until around the mid of 2009. The second plot extends a little further. And then the second use of ECB, which is where I put my second red arrow, is that they also then started buying some securities, which they hadn't done before. And so they started buying some Greek debt, notably, as well as some others. Okay? So the big difference there is that they went from short-term lending, backed by short-term bonds, into nowadays long-term lending, backed by long-term bonds, as well as direct holdings of some long-term bonds. Okay? So if you look at their balance sheet today, again, the nose will things, the first arrow shows you how now, the same way that the, that the Fed has almost no T-bills, the, the ECB today has only 59 a million dollar uh, euro, sorry, of uh, short-term uh, lending. Almost all of it is now long-term. The second number there is then those 626 of uh, holding of direct securities, which used to be essentially zero. Um, let me point, which I will return to at the end, also that at the last or the bottom of the red arrows, which is showing the revaluation account. Okay, so the ECB now has this thing, which is revaluation account, which is a very large number. Um, and this is basically a reassessment. The accounting rules of the ECB are that if you have a gain, you can't post it. So you do not post gains, even if the assets that you're holding, the bonds that you're holding they made a gain, you don't post it on the asset side of the balance sheet. But if you have a loss, you have to post it, and you have to post it as a liability, which creates this funny asymmetry that of course builds up, because even if you have a loss today that gets compensated by a gain tomorrow, you record the loss but never the gain. But the big number there, the interesting about it, is that how big it is, and this is showing that they're holding a series of bonds, and therefore these revaluation accounts that used to be zero in that funny historic uh, accounting curiosity, this asymmetry, now gets very big because now you are holding a, quite a few things. Okay. Very briefly, the others, in a completely oversimplified way, the Bank of England looks a lot like the Fed, meaning it went from short-term to long-term bond, like the green thing on the upper left. The Bank of Japan looks a bit like ECB, but with very little change in that it has a mix of long-term loans as well as long-term bonds, um, but it hasn't changed much with the crisis. The Bank of Canada is back to almost normal behavior. Um, it has some liquidity facilities and those are gone. And the Swiss National Bank now looks a lot like those developing countries or those other countries they lost a lot, because they're basically all about foreign exchange and their balance sheet. Just to give you some context, okay? And then finally, the final fact that I would raise is the middle one, which is what's the collateral that the, that the Fed, the Euro system of the Bank of England are holding? Well, the Fed and the Bank of England now hold essentially zero collateral because they're back into normal business. They no longer do liquidity operations. They hold bonds. Um, but the Euro system is holding quite a bit of collateral through these long-term refinancing operations. And note that government securities are not even the whole of it. So in the same way that the Fed has added its mortgage-backed securities in its balance sheet, the ECB in some ways also has them, but through asset-backed securities that are being pledged as collateral, as, there, as well as a series of other bonds, it's always mysterious other bonds, which is a mix of, in the case of ECB, because it, it accepts a very wide spread of collateral, are very often public companies in Spain or in France which issue its own bonds, and where they're basically a little bit like agency debt in the US. So this new world asks the question that, that Mark has asked me to come and answer, which is what if they're lost in these things? And these things now, you know what they are, they're long-term long-term securities. And related questions, can the central bank go broke? What can cause the losses? How much can it take? Uh, can these lead to a risk of inflation? And can we measure the financial cycle of the central bank? And depending on the time, I'll try to answer all of them, but I'll see how many I can do. First of all, does the central bank's accounting capital, by which I mean assets minus liabilities, matter just in prior operations? And the answer, I think, is a resounding no, it does not matter. Um, it doesn't matter because just go back to accounting textbooks and why we even measure, subtract at liabilities from assets. We do it because we want to figure out what's the residual winding up value of the corporation if we decide to close a corporation. 
well, you can't really wind down the central bank. You can't run on central bank and say, let's close you down and give me the assets that are there. Um, what are you going to demand to exchange the money that you have for? Uh, and again, central banks have had negative net worth for more than a decade. I think Chile or I think it's Bolivia that had it for about 15 years without much of a problem. Basically, there's no limited liability like in the private corporation, so there's no residual winding down. Second, a second use of capital is to assess the market value of the corporation, and then you get into a lot into mark-to-market -market accounting or other types of accounting. The goal of the central bank is not to make profits, so there's no sense in which it has market value. Its shares aren't traded. It's historical curiosity. Like the central bank of Japan does trade shares, but they exert no control, and I'm happy to chat with some of you over lunch or over dinner why that is. Um, but given that you're not doing profits, there's no sense in which there's a value, a market value of trade or operation. A third reason is to ascertain, again, I went to an accounting textbook to get this, ascertain where the source of finance is, how much, who's financing the corporation, the shareholders versus the creditors. Again, the central bank, this doesn't make a lot of sense because one, governments like the US government did can always deposit bonds at the Fed, and so they're the shareholder that becomes a creditor. And secondly, the central bank can require reserves, in which case you have a very, a very interesting type of creditor, which is basically kidnapped to be your creditor. Um, so none of these are good. Moreover, this isn't even useful as an indicator. There's a, a literature, I would say a long literature, but certainly a literature trying to correlate central bank capital with things, and it basically correlates with nothing, uh, for, the base, for even the reason that accounting rules differ widely across countries. I told you about the asymmetric treatment in ECB. In the US, it's different. Every central bank treats its gold reserves differently. Market value, book value, value when you bought it, value when you maybe sell it if it's a profit, not if it's a loss. So that measure of capital is just very hard. <laughs> That does not mean, oh sorry, um, that does not mean, by the way, and I'll get to that, that financing doesn't matter. It's just that accounting capital doesn't matter. Even going back to economic theory, of course, when we learn about, when you learn basic principles of economics, you learn about objectives and you learn about resource constraints. You only learn about balance sheets or net worth when you introduce something like limited liability on the part of corporations or limited credit markets or perfect credit markets on the part of households. Um, none of those apply to the central bank, and therefore there is the balance sheet in some ways is not a very useful thing. Rather, uh, what is useful to talk about central bank is first the conventional way that we talk about. We talk about objectives, things like minimizing the variability of the output gap, of inflation, of the transaction cost of paying, of the fact that uh, bonds are in interest above what you earn on reserves. We talk about instruments, the money supply, the interest rate, I am there is the interest that you pay on the reserves. We talk about constraints, like for instance, I wrote there a Phillips curve, how do you trade off inflation by, by output? We talk about constraints in the form of the monetary transmission mechanism. How does the interest rate translate into output and inflation? And here I wrote in terms of a standard New Keynesian IS curve. Or even in terms of money demand or liquidity preference. How does, the, how does money demand it get linked to the interest rate? These are the ones that are usually mentioned, and these are all clearly important. And there's a third one that's not often important, but that does matter, but I do want to clear in, in, insist that this is not accounting capital, and that is the resource constraint. And the central bank has a resource constraint, like any economic actor does. In accounting terms, it would be the flow of funds or the income expenditure accounts. In some way, the Fed has it right. The Fed doesn't really publish its balance sheet, or it gives privacy instead to what they call the factors affecting reserve balances, which look, may look a lot like an accounting balance sheet, but it's not really, because the balance sheet per se is less meaningful. And so here is uh, what I take as a kind of representative uh, resource constraint. I have the first term is the interest. On the left hand side are the uh, which your expenditures, what you pay on reserves, the monetary base M, and the interest you pay on them. Second is if you purchase new bonds, and I allow there for bonds of several maturities with price Q. And so you can buy new bonds, in which case you have to come up with the resources to buy those bonds. The third term is exchange rate reserves, RT, which have to be bought at the exchange rate, ST. Okay? The fourth one is expenditures in sending money to the government, VT transfers to the government. And fourth, XT is our transfers to the private sector. You may decide to give money to banks for free. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit. On the side of the revenue, the central bank can print money. That's the change in the money base. And it has the returns on the bonds that are about to come due, which I'm multiplying del thereby delta to allow for default. So delta would be the recovery rate if you want it on the bonds. Okay? Now, in most I think it's true that, again, for most people who have taken some macroeconomic stats, something you've never seen this and even in academic papers, it's difficult to see this thing because for the most part, it hasn't mattered very much or it hasn't mattered until a year ago. And why not? Because, again, when we talk about central banks, in theory, either we talk about helicopter drops of money, Milton Friedman's famous analogy, which means the Fed, or sorry, the central bank doesn't hold any Bs, Bs are zero, uh, doesn't hold any foreign reserves, Rs are zero, even the Vs are zero, you don't send anything to the, to the 
to the so, uh, to the government. What you do is you print money, which is the right hand side, maybe after paying interest, and you drop it on people. That's X and transfer to the private sector. Uh, in which case you have this equation that basically does nothing to the rest of your model. The other one is the conventional model of what the Fed does. And what does the Fed do again? Think about the Fed as holding not paying interest on reserves, so I am is zero. Holding short-term bonds, so all those BTs just become one of them. Okay? Not holding any foreign reserves, all the R's are zero, and not giving money to the private sector, so X is zero. In which case, V, the transfer to the government, is equal to the change in the monetary base minus the change in essentially the value of the bonds, which, given that, the, the interest rate on the bonds is, well, Q is the price of the bonds, and you can translate the interest on the bonds, is equal to I times N, insofar as money is equal to the, to the bonds held, and that is senior as rent. And that is what many of you will see, again, the standard macro model will just write that directly. You have the senior as revenue, and that gets included. And then there's nothing really more interesting to say beyond making sure you for, don't forget to include the X and the V somewhere. Um. <clears throat> so this per se is not a constraint per se. However, there is a constraint there, and I, which I think is the right one, which is not network. And that is to say, and this goes, I think, close to some of what Chris was saying, and certainly some of what he's written in the past, which is that there's a limit, a lower bound on uh, the amount of series you can rebate, or alternatively, if this is a negative number, which probably it is, or it's up to zero, that you can extract from the fiscal authorities. And why is that their lower bound? Well, first, when the central bank was just a division of the government, if we go back 30, 40 years to many central banks, then in some ways it could just be a large negative number corresponding to the budget constraint of the overall government. In that case, it was very much of a weak constraint. However, what changes and what makes this a much more relevant constraint is when we give central banks independence to pursue a mandate. In which case we want them to be independent from pressure from politicians, in which case either because we think that politicians are mercurial or change their opinions, or because we know that they have an interest either for fiscal reasons to push for low interest rates, lower the interest service on debt, or in order to expand the economy. In which case you do not want to be dependent on getting money approved from Congress, basically. Okay? In some countries the rule is actually part of the mandate of the central bank. You have to rebate a certain amount of senior there. And you can even go to the point of saying that you want a central bank that cannot just try to make profits in order to build nice buildings and travel first class around them. Okay. So, second question then. Uh, what can lead the central bank to lose money? Okay. In the sense of making, therefore, the constraint bind. The classic case one is why I told you the exchange rate. So here I wrote, I just rearranged that equation in terms of, um, again, those, those Latin American countries of the last 20 years, and it is just, that constraint says that you're, the change again in the reserves times the exchange rate has to be smaller equal than the change in the monetary base minus the interest on the on the on the reserves. And so what happened in almost all of the cases that I discuss, the, that I showed you of federal making losses? Either they were paying a very high return on the reserves, which made a constraint bind, or they were sterilizing capital inflows, which meant they were accumulating reserves and they were and ultimately enabled to prevent appreciation of the exchange rate. So both the left and the and the right hand side worked against you. Or actually, this was the irony of a lot of those countries, it was a result of having a successful inflation stabilization plan. Because once you lowered inflation, you're one, contracting the money supply, delta M was, ne was negative, two, you're paying a high interest rate on reserves to so-called liquidity, IM was high, and three, the exchange was appreciating because you were gaining credibility, in which case the left hand side got higher. And so this is why it was so frequent to see Latin Americans in the 90s doing this. Um, I will talk about the ECB, Chris has talked a little bit about that. Uh, anyway, I won't talk about it, I don't have time. The second, the second reason why sometimes they get in trouble is if they bail out banks. Um, and, this, and this is again something that happened in Mexico as an example of this. And how does that constraint again show you that happening? I do literally do a big X to transfer the private sector, but there's also two other ways. One which is you pay again, pay again a high interest rate on the reserves as a way to transfer resources to the, to the central bank, to the, sorry, to the banks. Or you accept very low quality bonds, meaning bonds that have a high rate of default or a low recovery, therefore have a low delta. Okay? The answer to this, of course, is that if, if the central bank is bailing out banks, it's engaging in the fact of fiscal policy, so of course it's going to have a resource constraint binding at some point. You're spending resources you don't have. The Fed did not do this. The ECB is doing some of this by paying a fairly high interest on reserves and taking low quality bonds. Okay? Here was just a list of, again, all those countries. They all fit into basically these two cases. Let's think instead though of the Fed today. The Fed today, again, no, no reserves, but what you have there is the money, the bonds that can default, the interest on the reserves, and the bonds that are for maturity. Is this constraint, does this constraint necessarily bind? It doesn't necessarily in the following sense. If you follow the first best policy, the first best policy is to keep the Friedman rule, pay interest on reserves equal to the short-term interest on bonds. 
Well, if I know arbitrage, that was going to be also the return on the bonds. Okay? But then, as long as you keep the money supply equal to the bonds on the right hand side, then this constraint is never going to bind. It's all going to cancel out equal to zero, just as in the classic case that I told you before. Essentially, if you follow the Freeman rule, there's no seniorage revenue, which means neither positive nor negative resource changes. Okay? You can allow for whatever M and B comes out of money demand. You satiate desire for liquidity. If the, if the, if the private sector wants five billion of uh, monetary base, you print it. If it wants less, it goes down. You buy and sell bonds. None of that matters because that is always going to hold automatically to zero. Okay? Moreover, note that valuations, changes in Q don't matter per se. If you're not changing the bond portfolio that you have, the fact that the price is changing doesn't itself matter. So where is the risk for the Fed then? The risk is that is that delta, that in some states of the world, it's not that the price has changed, but that you actually default. The Fed can always hold to maturity, but at some point, it's just going to get a default on its things. And what are more likely to default, given that governments very often don't default, is probably going to be in the mortgage-backed securities. And that's going to be where that delta falls and possibly make, make that constraint buy. The ECB um, is actually in a much worse position if you look similar. And why is it in a much worse position? First of all, because it lends instead of holding bonds, and therefore such the counterparty risk. Maybe the banks will go broke. So even if the bond, and the collateral won't be enough. Second and similar, it accepts a very wide set of collateral, okay? And sovereign debt defaults much on the table. That is, that delta, which is the crucial, is probably very high for quite a few of those bonds, uh, sorry, very low for quite a few of those bonds. Moreover, you bought at a high price in the past. So that means that while on average, no arbitrage says that the return on the bonds is at least as high as the interest on the reserves, there are some states in the world in which you're going to get a much lower return than what you're paying on reserves. You've committed to pay an amount of reserves. You may incur a series of losses um, and therefore have that constraint buying everywhere. A third reason is what Chris was talking about, which is that the bound on V is much tighter. In some ways, that V bar is a much higher number because you can't be capitalized by the treasury. The Fed never ran this risk. What, so the, can the constraint buy for the Fed and CB? Yes, it can. And I think the scenarios are defaults essentially. What does it mean for inflation, the binding constraint? Okay. If you bind, and in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the cases, but basically if you go over again the terms, the re just reading this resource constraint, I think can be very insightful, at least that's what this talk has been about. Um, whatever you do, it always boils down to seniorage. That is, if you lose, if you indeed it starts binding and you need to move away from it, you need to generate seniorage. And you can do it in different ways. You can sell M by creating new um, central bank liabilities. You can print money. You can set lower interest on reserves. But it always boils down to the fact that there's only one source of resources for the central bank, and that is seniorage, either through a gap between the inflation target and the interest on reserves, or through, even if that's not enough, through higher inflation. But it always, always, always has to give. Something has to give. Then in my last minus three minutes or something, how could we then measure the financial strength of a central bank? I told you capital is a matter, so I'm going to end in a positive note, and this is where I'll, I'll, I'll refer to for 30 seconds some of the research I'm doing, which is, well, you can do something that I think is fairly natural, which is let's build the Lagrangian L that says we're, going, we're trying to think about some objective function for the central bank, and now we have to take into account this constraint. Well, what is the Lagrange multiplier measuring? It's measuring exactly what is the, how valuable it is to get this $1 or more of resources. And that's the grand multiplier. You can either calculate their present value, you can calculate their expected path, or even more interesting, you can calculate the strength at risk. What are the states of the world in which that constraint binds? And the Lagrange multiplier tells me exactly how much that's worth in terms of trading it off with inflation, the stuff that's entering the objective function. And so I'm doing some research that I'm doing, I'm very happy to talk to you about on value at risk for central banks or strength at risk, which is all about measuring the Lagrange multiplier. Conclusion, four questions, four answers. Central bank losses are not uncommon. They're usually due to foreign reserves and bank bailouts. Recent changes in the asset of the Fed and the euro system bring a danger, but the danger is important is not through evaluation. It's always through the bond not being paid. That is, default is the key. Third, if there are losses, they must be met with seniorage. Now, this may, if the losses are small enough, the senior will just have the normal seniorage revenue in the sense of deviating from the Friedman rule and paying less on reserves than the interest on bonds is while keeping the stable inflation. If losses get higher, the only way to do it is to raise the inflation target. Fourth, the capital is not a useful measure, but there are useful measures. Thank you very much.